approaching surface zero on D-Day, 14th of May, 1955. In less than 10 minutes, you will become an eyewitness to a most unusual atomic test. We'd like to use that time to tell you the story behind Operation Wigwam, a joint military and scientific operation important to our future security. What will be the impact of atomic weapons upon the freedom of the seas? Operation Crossroads at Bikini in 1946 gave us half the answer. We discovered what an atomic detonation in shallow water could do to surface ships. But half an answer is not enough when the question involves our country's safety. We had an urgent need to know just how efficiently an underwater A-bomb could kill an enemy submarine at sea. You all know how we did it in World War II. We had to do it with tons of high explosive. It was a costly business and not nearly effective enough. It cost millions of dollars to search out and find each enemy sub. And this expense did not guarantee a kill. Too many got away. The cost of not killing them was even more expensive. Billions of dollars, thousands of lives, cargo ships, naval vessels, troop ships. These were the reasons why we needed urgently to know how to stop an enemy submarine permanently. New weapons must be thoroughly tested under scientifically controlled conditions before they can be proven useful to our national defense. Several hundred feet below this barge is suspended an atomic bomb. But if we ever had to use it, how effective would it be? Operation Wigwam was conceived to answer these questions. Firm belief in its necessity was based on studies conducted by scientific and military personnel since 1950. Wigwam was launched as an Armed Forces Special Weapons Project in June of 1953. Almost a year later, the carefully prepared plan was published as a secret document. But there were many problems to solve before Operation Wigwam could become operational. The project offered our experienced Navy a new challenge to its skill and seamanship. Wigwam scientists were exploring new fields of research without the benefit of very much previous scientific data. Special consideration had to be given to the choice of area that could be used for this type of atomic test. Extensive studies were made of weather histories for many recommended locations and of the complexities of ocean currents at different times of the year. A large percentage of the budget was spent to solve this problem. The exact locality and time of year for the test were finally selected with the purpose of avoiding any schools of commercial fish. All of these studies were conducted with the knowledge that the amount of radioactivity resulting from Wigwam would be but a drop in the bucket. The ocean waters are vast, and we were testing a single A-bomb. To determine the military effectiveness of this underwater explosion, we had to have target submarines. To evaluate this effectiveness accurately at different ranges, we needed three identical targets. To simulate an enemy sub more realistically, these targets would be submerged and towed at measured distances from zero. It was essential for us to know the weapon's most effective range. So one of the three sister subs would be towed within the killing range, one which had been carefully created just to be destroyed. She was the first ship of her kind ever to join the Navy, nicknamed the Squaw. Her full name was Squaw Number 12. She's never had an engine. Wherever this Squaw went, she was in tow. Due to the hazardous nature of her underwater mission, she could never be assigned a crew. There's no man in our Navy that we'd order aboard to serve on the Squaw's voyage. So she was manned by robot instruments with electronic eyes and fingers to sense and to communicate the information that we had to know concerning the details of her fate.
To prepare for the final mission, the squaw was put through several dry run trials. And some that weren't so dry. Finally, at D-Day minus two, squaw number 12, along with her two sister squaws, and the rest of task group 7.3, arrived at the point of rendezvous, not very far from zero. Squaw 12, destined to be stationed within the killing range of the first deep underwater atomic shot, is submerged. Then she's secured to this small barge with an underwater A-bomb many hundred feet below. Many types of measuring instruments are assigned their floating stations, while others are put overboard to record and relay valuable scientific information. The entire array, now in tow by a single fleet tug, forms a sea serpent several miles long, the longest sea serpent in history. With the security guard alert for uninvited observers, the task group prepares for night steaming. Tomorrow will be D-Day. Each minus two hours. The liberated power of an atomic weapon is easily swallowed up among the mightier forces of the sea. Specially adapted ships, remotely controlled by shielded crews, steam into the hot water minutes after the explosion to measure the amount of radioactive residue. And wherever the currents may carry it, this ship and crew will follow, gathering scientific data until all traces disappear. If any radioactive remnants escape to the air, these aircraft will detect them. 
the operational phase of Wigwam is completed. Squaw 12 and her sister subs played their supporting parts well. Their performance taught us what we needed most to know, how to stop an enemy submarine, quickly, efficiently, permanently. Perhaps the atomic age can bring a lasting freedom, not just of the seas, but to all humanity.